San Jose, in the heart of Silicon Valley. It's theCUBE, covering Big Data SV 2016. And welcome back to Big Data Silicon Valley at theCUBE. Uh, my name is Peter Burris, and we are here at uh, the Strata Hadoop uh, conference across the street, uh, having a, uh, holding a, a wonderful event for uh, the CUBE community and some of our VIPs to talk about some of the challenges associated with big data. Now, you may not be able to see them. We got about 100, 120 people here. To give an indication of how excited everybody is, let me hear a yeah. yeah. <laughs> there you go. See, I'm not lying. <laughs> All right, so uh, this is, uh, we've talked a little bit about the relationship between uh, digital business and big data. We had a great influencer panel, some of the analysts from uh, Wikibon, Forrester, and Ovum talking about a number of different issues. This is really where the rubber meets the road. We're going to spend some time with some doers, some folks who are actually in the front lines, turning these technologies into value and solving hard problems in business today. So what I'd like to do is, starting all the way over at the end, I'd like to introduce Matt Olson. Matt, who are you, what do you do? I'm uh, Matt Olson, uh, Principal Architect at CenturyLink, and my mission in life is to uh, build, well, really intelligent self-tuning services for our network delivery for uh, software-defined network function virtualization. And if there's one thing that mm -hmm. you really want to make sure that we talk about, what would it be? Oh, how we get from where we are now to <laughs> that ultimate endpoint. Because we're, <laughs> we're not going to jump right to the singularity, but I really want to focus on uh, kind of an evolution and a progression to get to, uh, well, it's never an end point, but to get from here to there. Excellent. Rakesh Kant from uh, US Bank. Thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. My name is Rakesh Kant. People also call me RK. I want to make it easy for everybody. <laughs> I am a uh, Vice President, uh, Enterprise Data and Analytics Infrastructure Technology at, at US Bank. Um, one of the things that I would like to kind of uh, talk more about is um, we have a lot of workflows coming to a big data environment. I think uh, I'm starting to see some similarities with the mainframe days um, as the jobs run during the night, as analysts are looking at it during the day. How, how can we do better workload management and, and, and dedication of the uh, resources to the right workload at, at right times? John Furrier, co-CEO of SiliconANGLE, and an expert in uh, how big data and engagement come together. Yeah, I mean, I'm super excited to be up here. Thanks for inviting me. I was also the host of the Cube. But for me, I mean, I'm, I want to share and talk with everyone here about the role of data because we, uh, my, myself and Dave Vellante, are building a media business from scratch with no outside funding, which is challenging in today's environment, and, and we're succeeding. And one of the reasons why is we've been really focused on the role of data and open community and social media and building a data platform behind that using signals and predictive analytics and machine learning. And we're constantly thinking about how to use a platform to create an enabler uh, to increase the quality of content at higher speeds and put them into, into targeted audiences in a way that's not going to be offensive. And so we think about this all the time and we, uh, we, talk, we, we look at engagement and we're instrumenting, trying to instrument the conversations. And we have uh, a conversation platform that we've built. Microsoft actually announced the intention for one today, but we actually built one. And we actually look at what people are trying to talk about and try to create content to create engagement for no other purpose other than to create some engagement and some interaction, not to sell anything, but to really create more of an intimate relationship with each other. So each of you guys have deep technology chops and a job that is normally associated with technology. How much time do you spend worrying about the technology versus how much time do you spend worrying about the business problem? Matt, why don't you start? Oh, I, I think I spend at least half of my time dealing with the, uh, really the, the business side of the equation because at the end of the day, really it, it's about being successful as a business and, and also uh, affecting transformation of, of organizations. And uh, I, I think that if we focus on the technology in isolation, uh, it, it invariably uh, runs aground. So I'd say at, at least half of the time spent on the, the big picture and the big picture means understanding business and understanding customers, certainly. Now, Rakesh, U.S. Bank has done some relatively advanced things in terms of that data supply chain, that information supply chain, 
to a place where then you can feed it out to the various functions. How do you, how is your relationship to those functions evolving as the technology and understanding of how to use the technology evolves? Yeah, so I'm going to uh, concur with, we, we, we have to have business on board with whatever, whatever we're trying to do. If you don't deliver business value at the end of the day, it is just a science project in a, in a, in a, in a room somewhere. Um, when we started this journey in terms of strategy, uh, we wanted to create, obviously, uh, a single provisioning point for uh, all enterprise data in one place. Our customers have to go to different places in order to collect that information. We wanted to create a place where they can come confidently and get that data. Second, we wanted to, uh, one of our analysts were talking earlier about reducing time to data. Uh, it was more from a real-time perspective, but I use the phrase time to data. When a business has an idea, that idea requires data, they should be able to get to it easily. And we want to create that place where that data is available for them so you can select what you want in order to drive insights for your business. So time to data was uh, another factor. I think the third was we, because it's all going through one transition point, we wanted to increase the data quality. That's a perennial problem. Uh, data is being supplied today in multiple supply chains with various varied kind of uh, data quality. We wanted to have this one place drive the data quality and I would say conformity, right taxonomy, right harmonization of values. Uh, when, 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 when somebody says what product, you mean exactly what product. And the last, I would say, is security and um, governance. Um, because it's going through one place, and it's all in one place, we wanted to kind of have sec right security on top of it. So those were all the pieces of the puzzle that we wanted to achieve before we take uh, the next steps towards kind of making it available for everybody in, in a multiple access methods, ETL, SQL, analytics, uh, just file access, and so on and so forth. John, you have an extensive background in search and have been uh, utilizing open source tools to do some really interesting things uh, on a shoestring budget. You've been living by the proposition yeah. that grab that low-hanging fruit. Yeah. Uh, how's that going? I mean, it's interesting. You, when you have no real budget, you have to be you know, resourceful. We, were, we did the first um, solar search on HBase before Cloudera did. It was working great. We had great HBase implementation, and it was just so freaking expensive. Uh, to run. I mean, it had for us, we had to load a server. They were $8,000 a server. I had to go host it. I was a sysadmin. I couldn't hire anybody because they wanted a $150,000 a year salary to reboot it. And so it was really hard. So we moved everything to the cloud. Okay? I'm like, that has nothing to do with technology. Like, you're a sysadmin. Well, I can go to Uber and be a sysadmin and make $150,000. I'm like, go to Uber. We're going to move to Amazon. So we moved it all into the cloud. And so the cloud provides great uh, uh, on-ramp for that initial uh, bootstrap. And it's not about technology. The things we worry about is not is the is the partners. Uh, so we rely on external data sources like the Twitter firehose and other things. And that's a passive monitoring system that has nothing to do with technology. I worry about if Twitter goes out of business or if a partner data goes out of business. We are moving quickly to control the active data that we can control, and that's what we're instrumenting with our CrowdChat app, among other things, and the Cube Cube video. So for us, really focusing on the process of the consumption of the user that is non-linear. And that is a great opportunity for the unstructured data, but it has nothing to do with technology because the software is so awesome now. You can, you can really roll up anything. So if you think about the, uh, we talked a little bit about data governance and uh, making data a first citizen. Uh, that hasn't happened in most organizations. I was with a CIO not too long ago who uh, was absolutely lamenting the fact that the uh, assets that she was creating for the business were completely undervalued and therefore it was difficult to sustain the investment necessary because it just didn't show up the way that it should have shown up. Uh, Matt, as you mm -hmm. think about, you know, you're, you're in a relatively mature business mm -hmm. that has enormous operational expertise uh, that is dependent on data. Yeah. How is CenturyLink starting to evolve its thinking about data as an asset, or what we're calling data as digital capital? Well, I think first and foremost, the, the key has been uh, breaking down the, the silos, because it, I think the various uh, 
you know, the various silos within the company have their own, their own particular data sets. I think there's sort of in the culture, there's an appreciation for the value of that data. But the, the historical sort of legacy approach is, uh, I think, to focus on specific limited uh, data sets which were believed to be related to a specific problem set which the you know, organization owns. And I, I think the, first and foremost, the most important sort of transformation has been breaking down the barriers across the various data silos and beginning to engage users with enriched data with uh, contextual information to join across the various silos to begin to derive really more insights and, and far more information from the data. It's, it's far more than an additive process. And so I, I think the, the most important step from my perspective has been establishing uh, not only an infrastructure but a culture which allows for the, the sharing and the uh, you know, correlation and integration of data across the various silos. And those silos are not just uh, sort of end-to-end -end in the, you know, the, the service delivery path, but they're also up and down the protocol stack and you know, beginning to connect what, what people are seeing from a network and an infrastructure perspective with the, the experience that our, our customers are, uh, are experiencing in, in the right. service delivery path, which is ultimately what's of the greatest value to the, to the company. Well, same so, question, uh, mm -hmm. U.S. Bank. Is, is data anywhere near moving into at least second citizen role? Yes, definitely. I mean, it's, it's a journey. It's not going to be a point in time uh, activity. Uh, the maturity comes from people getting experienced with this uh, new technology, understanding the value as it happens over time. Obviously, the sequencing of activities need to be a little bit more uh, intelligent in terms of uh, we initially, because it's a heavyweight item to lift from ground up, so you need to have that burning use case that is going to lift it up. And then once it's lifted up, then you can take that whatever is up and ready for other use cases, and now the overall cost for everything is kind of coming down uh, slowly over, t over time. So it's a, it's a collective journey type of uh, um, kind of uh, journey. I, I would say, I, I think we have talked about um, analytics and trying to kind of how to, how to kind of make insights out of it. I, I think the basic lesson for me uh, has been the data is still important. The, um, the, the quality of that data is still important. The, the, the same perennial problems that were there before, they suddenly don't disappear yeah. just because we have a new technology. Yeah, absolutely. It enables certain aspects of it that you can scale, you can process at volume, and so on and so forth, but the basic requirement still remains the same. Absolutely. All right, so uh, audience, questions for uh, our panel? We have one. Joey Badash of Sama Technologies. Earlier I asked a question from Tony, but I'm more curious now asking the customers. Uh, there is a lot of buzz about systems of insights, and we were collaborating. I said, if it's not actionable, actionable or it doesn't have an impact, it really means nothing. So what's your thoughts revolving around systems of insight or actionable insights? Oh, well, my take is I think there's definitely um, a problem with getting action out of the insights. The insights is easy, I think, and certainly I think it's early days. Here's the problem with action. What does that mean? So the context of action is, one, defining what you want to target insight to, and then having a destination endpoint actually be compatible with receiving that insight. So we have a huge problem in our business, in the media business, called content management systems. They were built for polling databases, not push notifications. So every single media company on the planet pretty much has a flawed infrastructure on receiving an endpoint, which is essentially a JSON feed, for instance. Real-time updates require precision and targeting, so the endpoint actually isn't ready for the insight. So there's no action that can be taken because the apps are, are not mature. So I think there is an insight there, so that's my observation. Even if you could produce the actionable insight, getting it right is really, really hard. And then two, having an endpoint that can receive it. So that's a huge problem right now that I think will be overcome pretty quickly. And actionable insights, uh, we talk as if there's only one insight at a point in time, but I think 
when you look at a customer, there might be multiple insights that are applicable to that customer. The question is which one we should move with. Uh, you, are, you are eligible for a loan and you're eligible for a card. Which one is better, even though both are actionable insights? So sometimes it needs to be which one is the right. And sometimes it is, even though those are valid things, you don't need to move on it because we have called them multiple times or we don't need to kind of upset the cut. So actionable insights and the relative importance of those is also important in, in, in action. Thank you. And I, I could speak to this, I think, in uh, probably a, a very different context, which is the, uh, the network itself. And uh, in, you know, in my world, I, I think the, the key is sort of joining the, the data that's generated from the underlying network with the data that's generated by the customer's interaction with that network and the services it's delivering. And at the end of the day, it's the, the customer interaction, the, the quality of the experience, which tells us uh, where, we, where we have opportunity or where we have challenges, what, what really matters to the business. And it's the, uh, the data flowing from the underlying network and infrastructure that tells us what actions need to be taken. And from my perspective, the, the advent of software-defined networking and network function virtualization is, is really exciting in this regard because it provides an infrastructure which is, by definition, ready to accept the, the you know, actions, the insights yeah. via API calls and such. So I, I think really for the first time in, in my world, we're, we're seeing the, uh, the opportunity to build really intelligent feedback loops and build intelligence into the service delivery which was you know, almost unimaginable. Uh, yeah, I mean, the only thing up. that's actionable right now, just to add in my comment, is that you see that this is a clear indication of the maturity of the insights being generated in the consumer data. Yeah. You see smiley face or sad face, <laughs> okay? That means there's not there. And then, you know, what animal are you? You see that on Facebook all the time. So, or what does your Twitter feed say about you? So that is so uh, early. They can't actually generate the insights. So there's a lot of unknown spots. So that's an indication that the predictive analytics can only predict extremes. Are you happy or sad? And that's it's just baggage from natural language processing technology from the 80s, essentially. Yeah, yeah I, was, uh, I wrote a paper uh, in the early 1990s on action support systems uh, that uh, I found out that that name wouldn't play well. The acronym wouldn't play well in Long Island. Um, <laughs> another question? Who are you? Thank you, George Simons, IC Ventures. Not that John can answer this, but I'm, I'm curious with the, the other two. Um, I've always believed you need corporate buy-in to make big data successful within your organizations. I mean, is the CEO understanding, involved, committed? What level of corporate buy-in do you have? I'll take the first. I think, uh, yes, we do have corporate buy-in. Uh, the chain, chain of management has uh, been behind this effort for some time. We have been working on it for two and a half years, and it has been critical and crucial to support our financial crime and compliance initiatives. So it has been very, very visible, the burning use case and visibility across the organization. And I think from, from my perspective, we unquestionably have uh, buy-in at the... Uh, the highest levels. The, the issue, of course, is defining exactly buy-in to, to what in practical terms. And it's very much, in, in my experience, a, uh, a situation in which there's, there's iterative development and demonstration of value and an evolving strategy. But I think at, at a high level, uh, in, you know, in the telecom industry as a whole, it's, it's very clear that we're in the early stages of a massive transformation. And there's full buy-in to uh, embarking on that transformation and there's I, I think a, uh, a full buy-in and understanding to the fact that, that that transformation is inherently dependent on intelligent use of the data. So uh, in you know big picture conceptual terms I think we have solid support. The key is now to iterate rapidly and demonstrate value and build momentum. Another question from the audience? Oops. Who are you? Hi, I'm Sandy Holder. I'm CEO of Insight Business Advisors. I actually have um, helped fund quite a few companies that are growing and developing in the business analytics environment. And the biggest question I think that we all have is that at what point in time do you have a CEO or CFO that today could capture information 
on his mouse, on his dashboard, slide it across, slice and dice the business, and be able to capture information, and then more importantly, be able to have this, as they said before, advanced intelligence to be able to kind of predict or have some measure of probability about the kinds of things that they could or should be done. Either there's gaps in the business, there's challenges with whatever part of the business there is, but end-to-end -end business visibility, because I think that's at an affordable cost. So the question really is time and cost. How long do you think it's going to be before that happens? I'll take that. So I, I think it's a, it's, it's a journey. I mean, if there is a use case, uh, it can be done today. The technologies are available. Um, the, the question is, what is that kind of questions uh, that, that, that we want to answer. Um, a predictive and uh, I would say more interactive kind of analysis requires a little bit of thought. Probably means we have seen this. You need to be kind of aware of what the data is, what it, what it means, uh, and so on. So, so it, it can be done today. Uh, I would say realistically when uh, self-driving models and those kinds of things that can start kind of creating those kind of intelligence, we are, I would say, three to five years away. Yeah, I, I would just uh, just say I concur completely, and I, I think the uh, the key is not so much the, the general availability of, of technology which supports this in theory, it's it's the continued development and refinement of the, the models and integration both of the predictive capabilities and the underlying algorithms with uh, an environment that allows for user interaction with that information, with the data. And I, I think we're, we're starting to sort of take baby steps at this very early stage. I, I think we'll just see continued development over the coming years. John? Um, well, we run all of our business on Google spreadsheets and stuff, so we don't really have a system for that. <laughs> but uh, my, you know, uh, all the CUBE interviews I've done, I've heard a lot of great uh, insights there, which is, I just think it's so far-fetched right now because I think it's not a technology problem. It's mm -hmm. most people are trying to figure out what their business is. I think for the first time, you know, I hear in the cube all the time that this is the first time in the history of the world that everything can be measured for the first time. So that's mind-blowing in and of itself. So that is kind of causing people saying, "Oh my God, you know, look at my baby. It's not as pretty as I thought it was," or oh, "I'm in the wrong business." So you have all these kind of like moments happening right now. And it's you know, either going to scare someone to death or transform them. So I see it as the problem of what to look at, what data do I need to be slicing and dicing. And that, to me, seems the big the macro problem. And I'd say August 19th, 2019. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'll have one more parting thought uh, before we, we close and open it up for you know, moving out of the hallway and, and, and talking to each other. And uh, I think one of the most interesting tests of a lot of the things that we're talking about is there are a lot of companies out there talking about how they can apply big data to the challenges of marketing and revenue. And I have a question. If that's true, why aren't those companies growing faster than any other company in history? And I think that, for what John just said, one of the most interesting tests here is that this marketplace uh, should be using itself and its own technology to evolve and develop. And I think we're, as a test of whether or not we're really that close yet, it hasn't happened yet. There's a lot of marketing analytic technology companies out there that aren't blowing the doors off. Uh, there's a lot of big data companies out there that talk about what they can do for the customers, but aren't blowing the doors off. So it's going to require a lot of work, it's going to require a lot of commitment, and it's going to require an organizational effort, without question. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so with that, uh, let me thank everybody here for uh, joining us in our, uh, our sessions early. I think we're closing out uh, Q Broadcasting tonight, is that correct? Yeah, we're still, still live. We have a giveaway uh, raffle. Okay, we have a giveaway. When are we going to do that, John? Uh, after we break here. And okay, we'll, we'll break here. We'll go to the audience. I want to thank everybody. Thank you. Well, we can do it. We can do it now. Greg oh. can uh, put you. Oh, we're going to do it now? Okay. Yeah, pull it now. <laughs> live on the air. In instant. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you must be present to win. <laughs> oh, uh, we, we, are, we are giving away a, a, a smoky titanium. <laughs> oh, I mean, Galaxy Tab A. <laughs> so we're giving away a Galaxy Tab A, and am I pulling it? No, how about yeah, the customers? Yeah, pull. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, all right. And the winner is. <laughs> Ooh. Uh oh. <laughs>
<laughs> TK Akbai, Chief Growth Officer of Zumi. Hey. All right, come on up. up. <laughs> come on up. You're going to be on the cube. <laughs> All right. We're still live. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, excellent. Ah, congratulations. <laughs> what, is your what does your company do? Awesome. Uh, fantastic. Awesome. Congratulations. Oh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> All right. All right. So uh, with that, I guess we're right here uh, for uh, John Furrier of SiliconANGLE and Rakesh Kant of U.S. Bank and Matt Olson of CenturyLink. Yep. Guys, fantastic. Great insight. Great uh, analysis. Uh, very helpful. And Matt, you've now got an hour and a half to talk to everybody <laughs> about how we're going to get from point A to point B. Uh, thank fantastic. you very much from the Cube at uh, Strata Hadoop. All right, thank you. Great job.